So welcome everybody to the Speaking of China lecture hosted by uh, Rutgers Center for Chinese Studies. Uh, I'm Tao Jiang, I'm the director of the center. Uh, so please visit the center's website, rccs.rutgers.edu for all of the upcoming events. We have some pretty interesting stuff coming up. Uh, so RCCS, Rutgers Center for, Ru for Chinese Studies, rccs.rutgers.edu. And you can also follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash RutgersCCS. Tonight's talk is co-sponsored by Rutgers Global China Office. Let me introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Bai Tongdong. Bai Tongdong is the Dongfang Chair Professor of philosophy at Fudan University in Shanghai, China, and a global professor of law at NYU's law school. His research interests include Chinese philosophy and political philosophy. He has two books published in English. First, China, the political philosophy of the Middle Kingdom. This is published by Z in 2012. And the other one that was just published last year from Princeton, uh, it's titled Against Political Equality, The Confucian Case. So tonight's talk is based on the second book, the, uh, the uh, Against Political Equality, The Confucian Case. He's also the, the director of an English-based MA and visiting program in Chinese philosophy at Fudan University that's intended to promote the studies of Chinese philosophy in the world. His topic tonight is Of the People, for the people, but not by the people. Confucian meritocracy as a correction of democracy. Uh, so, Professor Bai. Yeah, uh, hi, uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor uh, Jiang, for uh, inviting me to uh, here to give this talk. And uh, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, I, we, we just saw there are a lot of friends, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, colleagues uh, all over the world, and which just makes me a little bit nervous. Uh, I was I was thinking it's a, it's a talk for uh, students uh, and not for uh, fellow scholars. And some of you have, may have heard um, some version of it before. And uh, so sorry uh, if I if you have to go through uh, the same crazy ideas again. Um, and. Uh, um, so uh, in in this uh, new uh, new book by uh, by Princeton, um, yeah, just self promotion, <laughs> just show, show you the book. Um, uh, so uh, the, uh, the the assumption, uh, the basic assumption, uh, starting point of my book is that uh, you know I'm focusing on the so-called preaching period, a uh, transitional period from the uh, the collapse of the Western Zhou uh, dynasty uh, to the emergence uh, uh, of the Qin dynasty. Uh, and uh, in the book, I argue that, uh, you know, the transition, if you have to find uh, a similar transition in Europe, uh, the best, uh, 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 the, 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 uh, you know, the, the, the European period that resembles this uh, Chinese transition the most is the European transition to early modernity. Uh, if that thesis holds, then uh, early Chinese thinkers, so-called preaching thinkers, they were facing with the issue of modernity uh, in some sense. And uh, uh, then um, there are three key issues, uh, not only for modernity, for, for any uh, political situation. And the three key issues are, first, uh, how uh, to bond the society together. Second, uh, you know, uh, between different societies, what are the principles of uh, uh, regulating their relations? Third, within a society, how do you select leaders of the society? And uh, in the Western Zhou period, uh, what we call the feudalistic uh, period, there were answers to these three questions. But then this you know, uh, system collapsed. Uh, now we are facing with a new political reality and these three questions have to be answered anew in this new reality. So that's the basic setup uh, on my book. And in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, state identity and the international relations. Um, I uh, propose the so-called Confucian uh, New Tianxia Order. Um, so there, uh, I try to argue we can use the Confucian idea of universal but hierarchical compassion as a glue for uh, to bond a state together. 
and that can also be the principle of international relation. Uh, uh, you know, to some of the the, the principle, I, I call the human duty overrides sovereignty. And uh, so basically, the idea that you know, uh, you know, a lot of problems we are facing today uh, are caused by um, uh, globalization led by nation states, which is a, which is a contradiction. Nation states, by definition, are uh, uh, for their own interests. They are they are against any global order. And now this global order is led by nation states. So I, I argue that maybe the Confucian model uh, can solve, uh, can correct the excesses of nation state uh, by offering this idea of human duty. Um, and uh, so that, that's uh, half, more, uh, half more, uh, of my book uh, is dealing with. The other half is dealing with the domestic case. You know, what will be uh, the ideal regime uh, within uh, a state? And uh, uh, in this case, um, you know, uh, actually, we will just talk to uh, another a colleague uh, who actually wrote a book, uh, End of Democracy, uh, 25 years ago. Um, and so uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, domestic governance, uh, I argue that, you know, uh, at, uh, you know, in early 90s, you know, uh, thanks uh, to Fukuyama's uh, idea, uh, the, the, the end of history, uh, a lot of people believe that history ended with liberal democ uh, democ democratic regimes. Um, and, uh, and now there are a lot of people who are critical of liberal democracy. And uh, uh, what I'm, what I'm uh, arguing for in my book is that, you know, we, first we have to separate these two elements of liberal democracy, the liberal elements and the democratic elements. By liberal elements, I mean rule of law, uh, rights, and, you know, things like that. And uh, uh, by democracy, most I, I mean, uh, you know, one person, one vote as the sole basis of, you know, uh, producing power of legitimacy. Um, and uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my basic uh, uh, idea that the liberal part is the good part of liberal democracy, and that should be preserved. And uh, so in chapter nine of my book, I argue how Confucianism can be made compatible with the liberal part of liberal democracy. Uh, but the democratic part is what uh, leads to so many troubles. So the dissatisfaction with liberal democracy a lot of people have today should be directed to the democratic part, not the liberal part. Uh, but unfortunately, even today, I think when, whenever people talk about liberal democracy, they think about popular vote. Uh, they don't uh, think about constitutionalism, freedom of speech, uh, rule of law, and uh, Things of that nature. So that's basically uh, the, the 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 general picture uh, on my uh, on my project. And uh, and before I go into uh, how uh, I, I'm proposing to correct the excesses of democracy, uh, let me just uh, clarify, uh, uh, make two clarifications. First, you know, um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, what I'm doing is often bundled together with people who are defending. China, the China models, um, and I'm not a, I'm not an empirical scientist. I'm, I'm I don't know why China has been uh, you know risen so fast in the past four decades. I mean I have my own ideas, but they're just you know ideas for, you know from a layman, uh, not an expert. Um, so uh, I'm a political philosopher by training. So I uh, what I'm good at is to imagine uh, to imagine uh, how the world should be like, not uh, you know how the world uh, actually is. So, uh, uh, so, so, uh, so I'm not trying to defend any form of China model. Rather, I'm trying to uh, to show why uh, certain Confucian ideas are still viable today. So I'm not uh, saying China to save the world. Rather, Confucianism to save the world. So that's um, a project. Uh, and secondly, um, in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, one, I mean, in, in throughout the speech, I, I will uh, mention. I will use the term Confucianism, but Confucianism has 2,000 years, maybe 2,500 years of history. Uh, you can find almost any kind of Confucian you like uh, from the Confucian tradition. Um, and so when I say Confucianism, I really meant uh, uh, Mencius, uh, or the book, the Mencius, uh, in the Analects. Um, and uh, the Analects, you know, uh, uh, is very, is a collection of very, uh, uh, 
brief conversations between Confucius and uh, some of his friends and uh, pupils, and Mencius is more elaborate. And Mencius also lived uh, uh, toward the beginning of the Warring States period when this new social uh, um, reality became more uh, uh, um, established. So in that sense, I think you know, to use Mencius to address the issue of so-called modernity uh, might be, uh, 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 might be uh, more appropriate. Uh, so that's why I'm using Mencius. And also, you know, no, I think nobody would challenge uh, uh, the claim that Mencius is a Confucian. You know, if you find a, a, a very obscure Confucian thinker and say, you know, that's how Confucian would look at this issue, then it's, it's dubious, you know, why you find this obscure Confucian instead of you know, uh, someone we, uh, we uh, all recognize uh, as Confucian. So uh, just to be clear, whenever I say Confucianism, I mean ideas from the Manchus. Um, so um, as, I'm, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, uh, I think um, what the world Manchus lived in was kind of a world of early modernity. And one uh, important aspect of this modernity is the emergence of equality. Uh, because the West, Western Zhou regime was based on nobility by pedigree. And then that regime collapsed. Now we were born, uh, people were born to be equal because, because we're, people were not born to be unequal anymore. People were not born into a class uh, anymore. So equality was kind of a, a, you know, a, a consequence, an epiphenomena of the collapse of nobility. Uh, but then, Philosophers are free to uh, to uh, 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 um, to take this you know uh, empirical phenomena uh, to whatever direction they like. And uh, for Confucians, I think they embraced uh, equality. Uh, for example, Mencius was once asked uh, whether everyone should be uh, everyone can become a Yao and Shun, the ideal state ruler for Confucians. And Mencius said, yes, everyone can become uh, the best human being. Uh, uh, in human history. Um, and uh, so now if everyone is equal, the question is who, who give, then what gives the right for someone to lead uh, other people, right? So the, the issue of political legitimacy becomes uh, an issue. Uh, you know, uh, in, in the feudal regime, in the Western Zhou regime, there were, uh, there, uh, they had an answer to the issue of political legitimacy, but that answer was not legitimate anymore. So now they have to answer this issue again. And uh, uh, for Confucians, uh, you know, uh, um, to answer this question, first they argue that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the garment, uh, the legitimacy of garment comes from the service uh, to the people. And then uh, to people's what? You know, uh, I think first and for, for, foremost to uh, people's material well being. Um, and, uh, um, but even if the, the people's material well-being is uh, satisfied uh, in, in the passage in the Mencius, 3A4 of the Mencius, uh, uh, Mencius said that, you know, uh, uh, when Yao was the ruler of the whole world, uh, you know, uh, people were, didn't have enough food, they didn't have security, so he appointed uh, ministers to take care of those things, security, food, you know, housing, clothes. And then when those needs were met, uh, 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 I mentioned that people still uh, behave almost like animals. And Yao, the state ruler, was again worried. So he asked, uh, he appointed a minister to uh, um, uh, teach people basic morals. So from this uh, you know, uh, story, uh, what I consider kind of a Mencius version of the state of nature account, uh, he, uh, uh, he argued that, uh, you know, garment should first, uh, you know, satisfy people's material needs and then satisfy people's uh, moral needs. And uh, in terms of what makes hu uh, people human beings, actually the moral needs are more important. However, before we can make human beings truly human beings, you know, make and give them basic morals, uh, they have to be uh, materially uh, uh, satisfied. Uh, so in, uh, in, uh, in two other places, Mencius explicitly said that, uh, you know, um, 
uh, 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 people have to have property in order to have proper minds or character, stable character, stable means of support in order to have uh, a stable character. If they didn't have a uh, stable means of support uh, due to the governmental failure, they would commit crimes. Then if you, if you, uh, if you, uh, if you, uh, if the government uh, arrested the criminals, then uh, mentions that that's entrapment. So in that sense, the government is responsible for the crimes uh, people committed out of uh, necessities. Uh, so uh, in that sense, Mencius uh, already offered the, uh, uh, introduced the idea that uh, government has responsibility to, uh, to, pr uh, to provide basic goods to the people. Um, and actually a, a political theorist, uh, uh, Sam uh, uh, Fleischer argued that uh, until uh, it's it's not until 18th century uh, Euro uh, did Europeans introduce this idea that government needs to uh, provide basic goods to the uh, common people, um, and uh, um, but Mencius already introduced uh, uh, this idea, um, and uh, uh, so that's you know what um, uh, gives uh, legitimacy to a group of leaders. Uh, uh, you know they satisfy people's basic material needs, and also uh, teach people basic morals. Um, but then uh, if, uh, if this requirement is just, uh, it just requirement, it doesn't have any teeth, then it just, it just, it just uh, you know, a uh, uh, requirement in paper. Um, but ministers did believe that uh, um, government should be held accountable for providing basic goods. Uh, to the uh, to the common people, and uh, so he has this idea of accountability. Uh, and uh, uh, so, in one passage, five eighty five of the mentions, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, people of his asked him, you know, how uh, the next ruler is um, um, becomes uh, becomes a ruler, and uh, 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 mentions says, uh, really, uh, you know, is is uh, you know heaven that uh, has the authority to appoint the next ruler. But um, finally, he says, heaven sees through, uh, uh, with the eyes of the people, heaven hears with the, the ears of the people. Uh, so uh, in this passage, he seems to be saying that, uh, you know, um, really it's the people who uh, offer the final say uh, on who should be the next ruler. Uh, and in, the, in this passage, actually he also said that, uh, you know, gods, should be happy with uh, the selection of the next ruler. But, uh, you know, uh, how we know gods are happy, uh, it turns out that, you know, uh, this, uh, this uh, you know, uh, uh, candidate um, should perform certain rituals properly. Uh, so in my book, I, I argue that it's sort of like, you know, in order for, uh, uh, you know, American can uh, presidential candidate to become president, a certain ceremony has to be performed. It has to be performed properly. Uh, so I think in, uh, in, uh, in the presidential inauguration, uh, I think one time uh, uh, Obama, he had to uh, uh, you know, uh, swear the oath following uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, but the, the Roberts uh, read the, uh, the oath wrong and then they had to do it again. So I think you know, that's really uh, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the satisfaction of gods. I think it's, uh, what I'm saying is that it's, it's a kind of procedural thing. The real substantial thing is to, uh, uh, to satisfy people's eyes and people's ears. Uh, I think that's the substantial uh, um, uh, requirement. And uh, in another passage, uh, 7B14, uh, Mencius said that actually if, if we give sacrifices to gods, but then there's, there's, uh, there's still flood. You know, uh, because gods are supposed to protect people from flooding and things like that. If we give people, uh, if you give gods uh, sacrifices, uh, but there's still flood, then gods should be replaced. So here we see that even gods should be held accountable to satisfy people uh, to the satisfaction of people's needs. So, um, um, so according to Mencius, uh, you know, rulers should be held accountable to the satisfaction of people's needs. If they fail to do that, they can be removed. So in two passages, 1B6 and 1B8, two very close uh, passages, uh, mentions, you know, uh, you know, introduced this idea. Uh, so in the first passage, he asked the king, you know, uh, 
uh, about the hypothetical case. He said, you know, if I'm traveling, I ask a friend to take care of my family, but when I return, my family is starving to death. So what should I do with the friend? Uh, Mencher says, then break up with this. Uh, I mean, the king said, uh, break up with this friend. Then he gave, uh, Mencher gave a similar situation. Finally, he said, but what if under uh, the, uh, the, the leadership of a king, people are starving to death? And the answer is obvious. And this is one of the very few uh, moments uh, in the Mencher's you know, a reader um, might, you know, be laughing. You know, I mean, Mitch is a very serious person. Uh, he's, 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 he's no fun to be with. Uh, but, you know, uh, this is probably one of the very few places uh, where, you know, uh, reading Mitch you know, gives you a laugh. So the answer is obvious, but the king didn't want to say, you know, if I, did, uh, if I do a poor job, I should be removed. So instead, in the Mitch, it's recorded that the king looks around and changes the subject. So he didn't want to give the answer. Uh, but then I think the king, the king was really annoyed by Mencius. So uh, 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 you know, a passage later, a section later, he came back to Mencius. He asked Mencius, you know, um, you know, Confucians are, are kind of you know, loyalists or have the reputation of loyalists, loyal to the king. But how could, uh, how could it be the case that uh, you Confucians celebrated two lords who overturned their kings and become kings th themselves. And in one case, actually, the Lord uh, killed the, the king and became the king himself. Uh, so the, uh, the, the king, uh, Mencius, had a conversation with, asked Mencius, you know, how, how could Confucian support regicide? And Mencius answered that, you know, of course we Confucians are against regicide. But, you know, the, the, the king that, that was overturned and then was killed uh, was, had the name of the king but he didn't do king's job. Therefore, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's only a king in name. He's not a real king, he's a mere fellow. So later actually the term mere fellow in Chinese become synonymous with tyrant. So um, Mencius says, so he's, he's a mere fellow, he's a tyrant. So we're not against kill, the killing of a tyrant, although we're against regicide. So um, now we see that for Mencius, the government should be held accountable to the satisfaction of people's needs. And if, if the government fails to do it, it can be removed. Uh, and uh, uh, for me, it's, it's totally legitimate. And because of this, uh, some, 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 of my, uh, some, of my, uh, some of the contemporary Confucian scholars argue that we Confucians have been democrats all along, right? You know, because we have all these democratic ideas. Government needs to serve the people and should be held accountable. Um, but uh, if you use uh, really uh, President Lincoln's uh, you know, uh, phrase uh, about democracy, so democracy is of the people, for the people, and by the people. I think you know, for Confucian, clearly government is for the people. Whether government belongs to the people, of the people, that's debatable. Uh, actually, Joseph Chen, uh, Hong Kong-based uh, you know, uh, political theorists argue that you know, uh, uh, for Confucians, Government is not of the people, and I I, I try to argue uh, actually uh, you know uh, for Confucians, government is of the people. So uh, there are some debates. I discuss this uh, in my book. But just just uh, uh, just uh, for argument's sake, let's just suppose that you know for Confucian, government is of the people and uh, uh, and for the people. But clearly, uh, for for Mencius at least, uh, government is not by the people uh, because. Uh, although, uh, as I mentioned, as I quoted, in 585 of the mentions, um, mentions did say, uh, you know, heaven uh, uh, nominates, uh, 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 nominates the next ruler, but heaven hears uh, through the ears of the people, heaven sees through the eyes of the people, but never uh, did mentions say, when people say this is a good ruler, then uh, this guy should become the ruler. And the, in the two passages where uh, Mencius talked about the removal of uh, of unfit king. He never said people are doing the removal. And actually, in the two cases they were discussing, it, it were two very human lords who had a certain position already. They did the removal, and now uh, now the people uh, themselves. And uh, uh, in another passage, three four of the Mencius, uh, there. He explicitly uh, made a distinction, a kind of notorious distinction. He said that uh, 
there are the great men or great people, and there are the small people. And actually, in contemporary Chinese, to say someone is a small person, it's almost like an insult. Um, and, but for Manchus, uh, really, uh, whether someone is big or small is almost descriptive. Because for him, we have four uh, uh, germs, four beginnings, or four sprouts of morality. Uh, of, uh, of morality. Uh, uh, there are four cardinal virtues for Manchus, and uh, everyone has the four sprouts, four beginnings, four, or four potentials of these uh, four uh, of these four cardinal virtues. And, uh, but these four beginnings are like the four limbs uh, of a baby. If you grow them, you become adult, a big person. If you don't grow them, uh, then you, you, you remain a morally small person. Uh, so Mencius in 384 said that uh, you know, leaders of a state are the great people, are those who can grow their moral potentials fully. And those who cannot grow the moral potential fully are the small, uh, small people. And here, Mitchell doesn't really explain why, but he seems to believe that the majority of the people, the masses, are the small people. Uh, you know, uh, they are the ones who fail to, uh, to develop their moral potentials fully. So it's kind of interesting. On the one hand, Mitchell believe that everyone has the potential to become uh, the, the greatest human being. Uh, uh, out there. On the other hand, he, he, uh, in reality, he believes that only the few can make it. Um, he doesn't really explain why this is the case, but that seems to be a firm belief of his. So I take it as the, the, uh, one of the fundamental assumptions of Confucianism, uh, the idea that on one hand, we're all equal in, uh, in terms of potentials. On the other hand, in reality, only the few can develop uh, the necessary moral potentials fully in order to be qualified as political leaders. Uh, so, um, so I, I, I don't have an explanation uh, of this point. You know, and this is uh, you know the fundamental assumption uh, confusion have about human nature. Um, then, uh, you know, uh, based on this assumption, uh, then uh, let's see what kind of uh, um, regime uh, they would like to uh, uh, to have, right? Uh, so, um, um, the kind of regime uh, they like to have, it, if you think about it, uh, is a regime where, you know, uh, uh, people's potentials have to be uh, 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 acknowledged and uh, supported by the government. But at the same time, uh, because in reality, only the few can develop the potential fully, the few should be given more power in political decision-making process. Uh, so it has to be some sort of mixture of these two elements, right? On the one hand, you know, people have to um, be able to express their satisfaction with the government. Uh, so um, actually that's why freedom of speech has to be guaranteed in a Confucian ideal regime. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, uh, um, but, uh, uh, but people's satisfaction uh, doesn't have a, a, de a decisive force. Uh, it is like a, a kind of weather forecast. So people, people's dissatisfaction is like you know we uh, weather. You know it's going to be uh, 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 going to be raining or snowing. But what what do we do with the rain or snow? And um, that's not up to the people. Rather up to the uh, the Confucian meritocrats, uh, the people with Confucian marriage, who are few in number, according to the mentions. Uh, so that's the, uh, the Confucian ideal. Um, then the next issue is why this ideal is still viable. Uh, so in order to argue why this ideal is uh, still viable, uh, so uh, in my book, I argue why the opposite ideal, the ideal that uh, the idea of pop, uh, popular governance, uh, the uh, self-governing by the people, why that ideal is deeply problematic. Uh, to, show, uh, uh, to show that ideal is uh, problematic, then I can argue that you know, why uh, the Confucian correction of uh, uh, popular governance through, kind of uh, through meritocratic elements uh, is, uh, is a viable alternative.
so what are the uh, the problems of uh, uh, of uh, uh, democracy then? Uh, one person, one vote, or popular governance expressed through one person, one vote. Um, I mean, before I go into the problems, uh, you know, one uh, uh, common uh, kind of almost knee-jerk reaction to any criticism of democracy is the appeal to uh, a, a, a claim alleged, uh, uh, you know, attributed to uh, to Churchill. Uh, the claim that uh, you know democracy, the worst form of government, is set for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. Uh, so de democracy is bad, but not as bad as all other alternatives. But to me, you know, uh, to the appeal to that claim uh, is a sign of intellectual laziness. Because have you ever ha ha have we have we really tried all the other alternatives? Have we really considered all the other alternatives? Um, so, so, so let, let's see, you know, uh, what the problems with democracy are and see whether, at least theoretically, there could be a better uh, uh, solution of these problems. So, uh, in terms of the problems of democracy, um, I mean, first of all, I, I, I want to clarify, maybe I'm going to use American democracy, uh, the real world American democracy, as examples to support uh, my analysis, my following analysis, but uh, I think my analysis is purely theoretical. It's about uh, the theoretical framework of one person, one vote, not about any real world democracy. So it's not, uh, so I'm not comparing the ideal Confucian regime with a real world democratic regime. I'm comparing the ideal Confucian regime with an ideal democratic regime. Okay, so, uh, so going back to the issue, uh, problems with democracy. I think the first problem with democracy is the, uh, the, the, the very idea of popular governance. The idea that we the people can understand the politics the best. Uh, you know, uh, this idea often comes, uh, doesn't necessarily come, but often comes with the idea that, uh, the, you know, uh, elites have no justification to rule over us. Uh, and uh, so, uh, 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 so uh, 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 a consequence of this, um, not a necessary consequence, but uh, a frequent consequence of this understanding is kind of mistrust of government, mistrust of the ruling, uh, ruling elites. Uh, and I think that's, that's, a, uh, that's very poisonous to a healthy democratic atmosphere. Uh, I think uh, this problem is, I think, most vividly shown uh, in today's American democracy. Uh, the idea that you know every politician, uh, uh, every political candidate, uh, when he or she is running, uh, and, you know, says, you know, let um, vote me to Washington, uh, and uh, my mission is to destroy uh, the place I'm going to. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm running to, right, uh, uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, so I think, you know, that's, that's a very, very poisonous um, uh, uh, combination. And uh, I think Trump is the, the most recent uh, symptom of this poisonous uh, atmosphere, uh, the uh, suspicion, the deep suspicion of the elite um, as, as a sort of byproduct of the belief in, uh, in popular uh, public governance. So that's the uh, the first problem. And second problem, uh, um, I think a much more serious problem is that you know, one person, one vote only gives the political decision making power to the to the voters, to the present voters within a state. However, a lot of political issues do not only concern with voters, uh, uh, you know, uh, present living voters within a state, right? For example, like uh, you know, a deficit, federal deficit, like environmental issues, right? Federal deficit is about spending future generations' money and foreigners' money to satisfy present voters' needs, right? But only present voters have a say on this matter. So you can you can see why this issue is so difficult to solve. And uh, in uh, uh, environmental issues, especially climate change, climate change. So there is a section in my book I call climate change. Uh, climate uh, change is a perfect storm for democracy um, because um, climate change again is about future generations. Is about uh, some uh, at, at at least now is about some isolated groups that uh, you know uh, far away from 
most voters. You know, uh, and the, the the people who suffer from uh, climate change uh, are people say uh, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, right? Uh, as long as you're not from that country, uh, you know, you, you don't suffer from it, and you don't have incentive to to vote uh, for politicians who do something about climate change. And even in the U.S., maybe only some people living uh, uh, in the shores of Florida would be affected, but they uh, they wouldn't be able to affect the policy of the whole country. And uh, so gradually they might become resigned uh, to the reality. And uh, so I think, you know, uh, climate change and all these issues uh, pose, a, uh, you know, a, a serious challenge to democracy that only gives political decision making power to present living voters within a, a state. So that's the second issue. And then even among present living voters, those who are powerful tend to silence uh, the, the powerless ones, the minorities. Uh, so in uh, recently democrat, uh, democratized countries, almost always the first thing that happens is ethnic cleansing. The majority, uh, you know, violently uh, eliminating min uh, minorities. So in a liberal democracy, of course, because of the rule of law, uh, human rights, things like that wouldn't happen. But still, you know, uh, uh, minorities tend to be neglected uh, because because of their lack of uh, you know uh, political decision, uh, lack of political influence through um, the majority rule. Uh, and finally, even among present living, uh, uh, even uh, among uh, 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 present living voters who are vocal, who can uh, you know express themselves and have their voice heard, um, there's still a problem. Um, because I think a, a, a assumption for democracy to work is that if every voter votes uh, uh, with his or her short-term material interest, if put all these votes together, we have the common good. Common good is nothing but the collection of uh, you know, individual self-interest. Um, so this uh, kind of idea uh, you know, uh, there's an underlying assumption, uh, uh, you know, uh, in this idea, namely every voter has to be rational about uh, his or her material interest. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there are now more and more literatures that argue that, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, rational vo uh, the voters being rational, that's a myth, right? Voters are not even rational about their own short-term material self-interest. Uh, and uh, in my book, I offer, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 two uh, arguments about why uh, voters are doomed to be irrational, even with regard to their own self-interest. Um, uh, the two arguments I offer are, first, you know, uh, uh, nowadays, uh, you know, all voters, uh, almost all voters are busy. Uh, we, don't, we don't have time. I mean, uh, I, I'm a political philosopher, I'm concerned with politics, but I, I don't have time to understand, you know, uh, if I were American, I, I still wouldn't have time to understand the tax policies of, you know, different candidates. And uh, um, then I, I, I just vote uh, on, uh, on a hunch. Uh, and uh, um, so I, I think that's one issue. I don't have, you know, I don't have time uh, or most voters don't have time to understand the complica complicated uh, policy issues. And secondly, uh, you know, uh, uh, today's politics is unfortunately very complicated, uh, even for a person who has all the time in the world to understand. And the reason for the complexity of uh, our politics is that almost every contemporary modern state is large and populous state. By large and populous, I mean, uh, you know, a state more than one million people, you know. Um, uh, so just let's look at the first democracy in human history to see, you know, why, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that, you know, uh, the two uh, uh, political realities today uh, pose a serious challenge to democracy. You know, the first uh, democracy in human history is the Athenian democracy. Um, but the Athenian democracy is built on slavery. Uh, so slaves, free the citizen, uh, you know, 20,000 Athenian citizens from the daily chores so that they can devote themselves fully to politics. 
Um, so slavery, I think, is not the accident for uh, Athenian democracy, rather is, uh, is a precondition uh, or is, uh, is the, the necessary condition for Athenian democracy to function well. Secondly, Athens is a small state. And, you know, there are only 20, uh, there are only 20,000 citizens. Uh, there are uh, 200,000 people, but only uh, 200, uh, only 20,000 are, are citizens. Uh, so uh, it's, 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 it's almost the size, uh, I think it's about the size of Rutgers University, right? And or Fudan University, uh, where I'm teaching. Actually, it's much smaller than, than Fudan University in terms of citizens, uh, the size of citizens. And, uh, um, um, and, and the, the, the size of state, you know, it's not, it's not, a, uh, it's not a, you know, accidental feature, rather, I think in politics, size matters. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so I quoted uh, a, a few uh, political philosophers uh, discussing this issue. One of them is the French philosopher Montesquieu. Uh, he argued that, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, the Republican form of government only works uh, in a small state. Um, and uh, in a mid, uh, in, in mid-sized state, monarchy is the only functioning regime. In a, in a large uh, state, only despotism can work. Uh, and uh, he uh, explains why that is the case. Uh, he said that, you know, in a small state, you know, uh, the individual, in the individual interest and the state interests are uh, in line with each other. And uh, in a small state, uh, people can understand politics uh, very well. And in a small state, there are no big factions and things like that. Uh, of course, you know, he's thinking about sort of the, the, the direct Athenian democracy. Now we have a representative, a representative democracy or indirect democracy. Uh, but still, I think uh, his concerns still stand uh, uh, in this larger scale uh, democracy. Uh, and uh, so, um, and uh, actually there, there are some, some other issues uh, uh, as well that support uh, Montesquieu's uh, idea. Uh, so a, a, a Plato theorist uh, of uh, uh, New York University, uh, Russell Hardin, uh, once argued that uh, if, if you're rational, you should never vote because, uh, you know, if you live in a state uh, that has more than one million people, one vote never counts. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, 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 um, uh, and uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, Tao uh, told me uh, I should wrap up uh, quickly. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll try to do that. Uh, so, um, uh, so, uh, so here are the, the problems of democracy. And now, if we see the problem of democracy, then we see maybe you know uh, uh, the Confucian meritocratic solution makes some sense now, right? And uh, to be clear, a lot of uh, political theorists, uh, you know, democratic political theorists also see the problems or some of the problems I mentioned, but they think that uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, we can solve the problem from within. So some people argue that the reason voters are not informed, the reason voters can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, influenced so easily is that uh, it is the result of economic, economic inequality or political inequality. Uh, and for Confucians, you know, because we all have the same potentials and, and therefore, uh, uh, we, of course, uh, if voters' incompetence is caused by uh, economic inequality, the lack of uh, basic education, uh, you know, uh, health insurance, uh, you know, medical care, and things like that, you know, then uh, that kind of, that kind of uh, 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 voter incompetence is uh, is uh, the responsibility of the government. The government should offer all, everything possible to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to make a leveling uh, play, uh, playing ground for everyone. So Con Confucians are all for equal opportun opportunities. And uh, so, but for Confucians, even if we get rid of all these obstacles, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, uh, inequality. Uh, you know, lack, lack of basic goods and things like that, uh, still um, problems remain because uh, the four problems I mentioned have nothing to do with 
economic inequality. Uh, and uh, so for Confucians, I think they are with a lot of democratic theorists uh, in their effort to uh, eliminate uh, economic inequality, you know, lack of uh, you know, health insurance, uh, the influence on money in politics. They're all for it. But then they would argue that even uh, with all these, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 corrections install, installed, uh, um, voters still uh, are uh, fundamentally inadequate to make informed decisions. So if that's the case, then we should do something about it. You know, one solution is to go back to uh, uh, some kind of aristocracy all the way. But for Confucians, uh, the legitimacy of the government comes from the service uh, uh, to the people. So for Confucians, people's voice uh, should count. But uh, you know, uh, people with merits, th their voice should also count. So uh, they would uh, uh, like to see a kind of hybrid where you know, uh, these two elements can balance each other and combined making political decisions. And uh, then, so uh, what is the, the, uh, the regime they, they, uh, they could propose? And uh, so uh, I think on the very local level, communal level, I think direct democracy uh, can be uh, a perfect solution, even for Confucian, because I think the key reservation I have with democracy is about the size of the state. So in a local small community, people can still make uh, are, are the best decision makers. So on the communal level, okay, uh, let people de decide directly. But on any higher level, uh, people's in, uh, inadequacy becomes entrenched. So in that, in that case, uh, in some kind of meritocratic voice should uh, be introduced. And how, how do we do that? So uh, a lot of, you know, most democracy today have the kind of back camera uh, structure, right? Have two houses. So I uh, argue that let's make the lower house popularly, uh, popularly elected to, uh, to represent the voice of the people. And then let the upper house meritocratic selected to represent people with merits. Um, then uh, you know, these two houses can together make political decisions. How, how do they do it? I think it can vary from one regime to, uh, to another, uh, um, you know, uh, by giving different quota uh, or different weight to the votes of the two houses. You know, I think that's up to uh, this uh, discussion. So, uh, so on any higher level, I think we should have this kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 hybrid uh, regime where we have two houses, one democratic elected, one meritocratic elected. Then the next issue is, how do you do the meritocratic uh, uh, election, uh, selection? Uh, so uh, in my book, I propose three mechanisms of meritocratic uh, selections. One is uh, exam-based. Uh, you know, Confucians uh, in the past uh, used exams to select uh, uh, leaders, select ministers. Um, but clearly nowadays, we cannot use exams alone to um, uh, uh, select and, uh, you know, members of the upper house. Actually, in later imperial, imperial China, uh, there were already too many people who could pass the imperial exams. And then the exam became just arbitrary. Uh, and so, uh, so in my book, I argue that you know, maybe we could use exams to, uh, as qualifications for voters who vote for members of the upper house. So uh, for lower house, every voter can vote. For the upper house, a voter has to pass a basic exam. Um, but of course, that's very difficult to, 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 to manage. Uh, so more realistic uh, proposal will be to ask candidates for the upper house uh, to uh, pass exams. Then what kind of exams? How can we uh, you know, ensure the objectivity of the exams? Uh, you know, uh, uh, we, you know, I, I think there are a lot of exams people uh, consider fair, right? Like an SAT uh, in the US, uh, we're actually, I don't know if P, uh, PJ is still here, Professor Ivanhoe is still here. Actually, he uh, suggested to me in, in an early version of my talk that, uh, you know, the foreign service, foreign service exam in the U.S. is a very tough exam. And uh, so that can be an exam uh, for candidates for the American Senate, because um, senators are going to make decisions about foreign policies, so they should know where Iraq is before they can become senators. 
Uh, so, uh, so that's one solution, the sort of exam-based uh, selection. Uh, the uh, second mechanism uh, is, um, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, kind of a leveled uh, model. Um, so uh, for members of the upper house, uh, uh, legislators, popularly elected legislators, uh, one level lower, they can vote for members uh, of uh, the upper house one level up. Um, uh, you know, actually, uh, 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 the American regime at its founding had this conversion uh, of uh, uh, indirect uh, 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 election. Um, uh, American, the American regime at its founding, the senators were not voted in by the people, rather they were voted in by state legislators. So that's what I call the leveled model. Um, because state legislators, they were freed from their daily chores. They were involved in politics more deeply, so they might be able to make better uh, decisions about who would, be a be who would be good senators. So that's the second uh, uh, mechanism. The third mechanism uh, is also kind of inspired by some traditional Chinese practices, so some kind of practical training. Uh, so uh, again, using the American setting uh, as an example, uh, so if someone is, a, is the governor of a state uh, for, two, uh, for two terms already, there is no third term, and he has approval rating of 40% or more, and he has no uh, criminal uh, charges uh, you know, uh, uh, when, he, uh, uh, when he serves as the governor of the state, then he can be sent to, to Senate for one term, 10 years, no re-election. Uh, no re so, uh, so he can do whatever he likes, uh, and his capacities have been already tested through his service in the two terms as a governor. So there could be other proxies uh, as sort of exams of people's moral and intellectual uh, characters. Uh, and so another thing I mentioned, you know, if in the, again, in the American setting, if, you're, if you serve in the military uh, and you become an officer, uh, and then if you go to a, 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 you know, a military academy, uh, then, um, uh, 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 then, uh, you know, uh, your moral character and the entire capacity is tested, then you can become, uh, 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 become a, uh, you know, a member of the upper house. Um, so this is my um, proposal. And uh, finally, uh, you know, um, uh, um, there are objections uh, to my proposal. And Tal said, uh, already told me, you know, my, my time is up. So let me just uh, uh, make one very quick defense uh, of uh, my proposal. So, uh, you know, my, my book's title is Against Political Equality. And uh, um, uh, 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 so my title is uh, Against Political Equality. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the kind of hybrid regime seems to challenge a uh, very sacred uh, uh, belief in democracy, the idea of equality. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, interestingly, uh, John Rawls, the American political uh, theorist, uh, you know, he's a kind of egalitarian philosopher. However, in spite of being egalitarian, uh, in, uh, uh, in the theory of justice, his, you know, most in, uh, one of his most important works, he said that uh, uh, economic uh, uh, inequality can be tolerated if the worst off benefits from the in economic inequality the most. Uh, so he called it the difference principle. So I said, you know, actually my proposal can be considered uh, based on a kind of political difference principle, namely uh, 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 a political inequality can be tolerated if the worst off benefit from this hierarchy uh, the most. Uh, so I think the confusion inside is really this. Uh, you know, inequality can never be eliminated. So instead of pursuing the futile dream of eliminating inequality, the question we should ask is which inequality is the best inequality? And of course, best for whom? For Confucians, best for the common people. And so they are trying to argue that uh, this kind of a uh, hybrid regime, uh, kind of, uh, in, a, in a way, politically unequal uh, uh, regime actually uh, serves the people the best. This is why this best kind of uh, uh, inequality. Uh, so that's uh, one response. Uh, that's my response to one of the possible objections. And I'm sure there are many other. I have dealt with uh, many others in my book, uh, but I, I, I should stop here and uh, 
uh, uh, uh, leave this uh, floor open to, uh, to questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so this is, we, it gives us a lot of materials to process. Um, so while um, uh, is, right now the floor is open for questions, um, I have two that's lined up. Um, people, uh, you feel free to put it in the chat room, then I'll view it. Um, or you can, uh, once we go through the, the list that's in the chat, then we can also, you, you feel free to unmute yourself to raise the question. So the, uh, right now, the first one I have is uh, Su Hyun An, who wants to ask a question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the, um, your presentation. Um, uh, especially with the um, COVID and climate change, this has been the the efficiency of the government has been the um, has been my interest. And um, I have two questions, and I'll, I'll keep it short because I know there are a lot of people who want to ask questions. And um, um, the first question is that um, I'm glad that you mentioned the. Um, you know, different like a House of Representatives and, you know, possible senators and that system, because I was about to point out that uh, when we talk about democracy in the United States too, um, we are like a, the, um, the scholarship, the modern scholarship really talk about the representative um, system, not the direct democracy, because the uh, people acknowledge that, you know, um, that uh, people have like a, as a group can have irrationality and also, um, yeah, so my question would be, uh, what would be your appeal to, uh, to the uh, regular, just like a uh, Western political theorists to consider the Confucian model instead of the um, arguments those uh, representative, um, um, representative system supporters, I would say. Um, so that would be my first question. And, uh, my second question is um, more like a comment, but also a question. So the problem I, I was having is that when we compare the you know wise ruler or like you know executive power or like a wise people who rule the government um, versus unwise people, then of course wise um, ruler is going to sound a lot better option. But I think that is unfair. Um, unfair comparison because if we are to compare, then we would have to compare a wise, um, meritocratic, you know, um, rulers uh, compared to wise people or like unwise ruler and unwise people. And it's, this is especially so because um, even with the meritocracy um, system, you know, even with the test, uh, rulers or people who have power are prone to make bad decisions or prone to make um, just immoral, immoral decisions. And yes, the ideal way, you know, it should be that um, they should be wise, but that if we were to apply that ideal um, criteria, and then it should also apply to a democracy where people would be wise. So if we were to consider a, an actual practical situation where um, people can be unwise, as well as the ruler can be unwise, then what would be the reason why we should take uh, choose the meritocratic system? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, I, uh, in my book, I did uh, say that, you know, why uh, you know, represent democracy doesn't uh, address the issue I, I, I raised. Um, because, I mean, uh, uh, still, you know, voters need to know whether the representatives represent me. Uh, but when politics becomes so complicated, I think for voters to make that decision is already too much to ask. Uh, I, I argue uh, in my, um, I, I argue in my book. Um, sorry, so, sorry, your first question again, uh, so what would be the appeal of the Confucian system? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. That, um, um, and, and, no, no, I, I, no, I remember. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, I think, you know, for my proposal to become a reality, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, real world uh, democracies uh, need to keep failing. And then maybe one state can do it my way. And then people start thinking, Maybe uh, that way is, is is a good way, and uh, so that's how I think you know uh, uh, 
uh, even if my proposal is the right proposal, that's how it can become reality. And uh, so in that sense, I don't see any time soon my proposal can become reality because, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, Western democracy encounter a lot of problems, but we end up with people like Trump, the wrong solutions, right? And uh, I don't think, you know, uh, China model offers a better alternative uh, either. And uh, so in that sense, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not hopeful at all. You know, I'm, I'm a little theory that can, all I can offer is the, the, uh, uh, the theoretical better alternatives. Um, and, uh, and then uh, it's about wise people making better decisions, you know, because um, by wise, I mean, you know, uh, for confusion, the, the most important moral character is to care for the people. And then wise means uh, whether someone is able to uh, exercise this care in a satisfactory manner. Uh, and uh, so I, I argue that we try to select the wise, say, through practical training, right? Whether, I mean, if you're a governor of a state for two terms already, uh, you, you prove yourself, uh, right? You prove your capacity. Uh, so actually, you know, thinking about the situation of Trump, you know, it just came to me that, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is a very easy way of uh, uh, realizing my proposal if we make you know, a requirement for any presidential candidate that, you know, the candidate has to be a governor of a, a state uh, for one term, then, you know, we would eliminate people like Trump, right? Uh, and, uh, of course, then you say, what about Obama? But I'm sure, you know, if there is such a requirement, Obama could uh, uh, run for the governor of state very quickly and very successfully. And uh, so and that's, you know, so there are ways of identifying people with marriage. But then you can still say that, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, wise people don't make good decisions. You know, uh, 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 JFK, you know, his cabinet is full of Harvard graduates, and, but they make terrible decisions. You know, that's why I think uh, 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 Chris uh, Buckley, the conservative uh, um, commentator, once said that I'd rather be ruled by the first hundred people in a Boston phone book, you know, than Harvard graduates. And... Uh, um, so to that, I, I say, you know, first of all, I think just uh, uh, to have a meritocratic element in a way is a good education, even for the average voters. Namely, you know, voting is not a right you were born with. Rather, voting, voting is a right you should earn through your effort to understanding politics. So even if those people don't make necessarily better decisions, they at least set up good role models for people to follow. Uh, and uh, um, then, you, you, uh, you know, um, yeah, so I guess that's my, my defense about, you know, uh, 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 using, uh, you know, uh, having this sort of a meritocratic element uh, in, uh, in this kind of a liberal framework. Thanks. So there's a question from Vida True. Um, Moral cap capability of a human being, as claimed by Mencius, presupposes his claim that the 10,000 things are all prepared within me. Is there validity in this claim? I think that's probably an empirical. Um, right, you know, uh, I, I think that's his basic assumption. You know, uh, that's why I think he believes in the equality of uh, potentials of everyone. You know, everyone has everything already, you know, so everyone can become whatever he or she wants to be. Uh, so. That's his uh, fundamental assumption. And uh, uh, so in my book, I, I didn't challenge any of these fundamental assumptions. Rather, I say, let's follow these assumptions and see what are the uh, results. When we talk about these fundamental assumptions, you know, I, I don't think we can get anywhere. You know, uh, uh, Menchen and Xunzi, you know, were followers of Menchen and Xunzi, you know, they, they had been debating with each other for, you know, thousands of years. You know, when uh, group argue we are born to be good. One group argue we are born to be bad. But you know, how how do you know? I I, I call this kind of debate sort of table thumping debate, uh, because eventually you have to thumb on the table to prove your point. You know who mm. thumps louder uh, uh, has the day. Uh, but so mm. yeah, I, I think that's his fundamental assum uh, fundamental assumption about equality of potentials. Okay, so thank you. So we have uh, Chu Yu Tian, and after that will be. Uh, you know, yeah, go ahead to you. 
Oh, thank you.、Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. I learned a lot.、Uh, so I have two quick questions. The first one is how does that, how is that different or resembles from the Wu Quan Fen Li as proposed by Sun Yat-sen by Sun Zhongshan?、Yeah. And the second question is, is I think especially the education. That aspect is quite similar because the Wu Quan Fen Li has a 教育院 like has a select like at public service exam system for uh for yeah for official for, ser- for civil servants. And my second question is um this still sounds a little bit elitist. So would the the elites that can pass those exams and um have the full uh uh like Capacity as a, a Confucian meritocrats, would they form a kind of elitist cliques and、uh, make policies at the expense of poor people who are less educated? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, about uh, Sun Yat-sen's、uh, proposal,、uh, yes, you know, there there's some there's some elements uh, uh, there, and actually, you know,、um, uh, uh, a lot of nineteenth-century、uh, Western theorists also propose some sort of.、Uh, Uh, combination. I mean, even John Stuart Mill, who defends representative government,、uh, offer、uh, argues that、uh, we should have plural plural voting. Those with higher education should give, be given more votes、uh, than you know、uh, those who don't. And uh, uh, yeah, so so in a way, I'm I'm、uh, restoring <laughs> the the earlier version of democracy. I think the the idea that you know everyone should have equal votes that's really a recent. You know,、uh, no, no longer than a hundred year phenomena.、Uh, mm-hmm. And、uh, about the the second issue,、uh, that's the issue I did address in my book. You know, so、uh, the kind of uh, uh, elitist element can become,、uh, you know, can perpetuate itself. Yeah.、Uh, you know, and、uh, um, so I think you know, in in the U.S.,、uh, this kind of、uh, thing was used to exclude uh, to exclude uh, black people from. Voting, right? And uh, uh, so, uh, so, th- so th- that's why I think you know, rule of law,、uh, you know, human rights, those things, and also equal opportunities、mm-hmm. have to be、uh, you know installed. And I think these are already extremely、uh, difficult.、Uh, so again, I, I don't think my regime can be realized anytime soon because you know, just to to achieve e- equal opportunities. That's probably already impossible, you know. Just to, to you know, we all have the same potential, but to give people,、uh, you know, access to education, healthcare, and all those things, that's already,、uh, you know,、uh, very difficult. But suppose we we,、uh, we can do that, you know. Then,、uh, you know,、uh, we could have exams that are independently designed, right? Like、uh, as I said, you know, we, if we could have SATs and、uh, foreign service exams, why couldn't we have a sort of a, you know,、uh, more Uh, you know, uh, 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 neutrally designed exams, and even if the、uh, exams are designed、uh, by certain people, as long as、uh, there's kind of open procedure,、uh, other people can take advantage of that. You know,、uh, the American College、uh, admission was designed to uh, accept, uh, uh, you know,、uh, the blue bloods, right, the the elites,、uh, the East Coast elites. But then, when the Jews came to the U.S., they quickly, man, you know, mastered. Uh, the admission process, and、uh, there was in, in、uh, you know huge increase of、uh, Jewish students in the 1920s at Yale and Harvard, and then they、uh, Yale and Harvard changed the admission criteria in order to get rid of the Jews, right? But yeah, right. quickly the Jews uh, uh, adapt themselves to the new、uh, new things. Actually, now Asian Americans、uh, are very good at this game. So I think as long as、uh, you know the、uh, the design is out there, even if it's designed by a certain group of people. As long as there's some kind of uh, uh, openness in、mm-hmm. fairness, I think you know it could be used to uh, select uh, you know、uh, the capable uh, uh, the capable people.、Uh, yeah, so that's my answer. Thank you. So next、uh, we have Jean Marie, and then after that uh, uh, Mario Kuczewski. Thank you. Thank you very much for a, a very in- important uh, lecture and.、Uh, I think you make a compelling case for different types of legitimacy that the one man one vote doesn't、uh, work as such if it's exclusive. But my question is as two two facets: is we live in a world of continuously expanding knowledge and ever more specialising knowledge. So I have a, 
I don't see how one uh, central uh, chamber, uh, high, upper chamber, uh, can, uh, can deal with that. Uh, uh, because more and more it's fragmented. Uh, and you can be good at international relations, but you have no clue on biology, uh, and so on and so forth. And the other aspect is that uh, knowledge does not provide all the answers. You, you, you took the very interesting example of climate change. Uh, we have to take measures to safeguard the future of our grand of children who will not get born. Uh, at the same time, we have maybe to spend money to prevent children from uh, dying before they are five years old. You have to make uh, difficult arbitrage between the present and the future. The scientist can tell you if I take if I take that option, this is this will be the result. But the, the ethical issue of balancing between present and future, the scientist cannot uh, give the answer. Uh, so you need an elite to reflect on that, but that elite, it has to reflect a sort of consensus, I don't know, of society. And, uh, and I don't know how you, you select uh, that, that elite who has that, that philosophical uh, bent that will reflect the values, the collective values of uh, society. These are my, my questions. Yeah, actually, before I answer your question, so how would you address the fragmented nature of today's world? So what kind of regime would you uh, have? I think more and more we need to decentralize. Uh, okay. I think more and because concentration of power, whether in big states or big institutions, is, will be seen to be more and more dangerous. And so mm. the, but, when I propose that, it creates uh, new problems because then how do you, articul do you articulate all these uh, smaller uh, entities? And you have to entrust them probably with professionals. Uh, and you see that in a way in a scientific congress and uh, there is a kind of peer si of a multiplicity of peer system that can work. The issue where I have the most difficulty is my second question because I, I I think yeah. it's very hard to answer that question if you don't have a kind of, of culture of civilization that bring people, brings people together on, on that issue. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, uh, for, for the question. And so uh, on the first question, uh, so in, uh, in my book on sort of the Confucian hybrid regime, I, I did have a section on uh, the, uh, the tension between local autonomy and uh, Kind of centralized government. Actually, uh, this is a kind of running issue for traditional Chinese thinkers. Uh, you know, uh, the Qin Dynasty that came out of this chaos was the first centralized rational bureaucracy, uh, I think, in human history. And this is probably why uh, Francis Fukuyama, actually, in one of his recent books, said that the state of Qin uh, was the first, uh, first politically modern state in human history. If you use uh, Max Weber's criteria of, uh, uh, of modernity. And, uh, um, but then actually a later Confucian scholar uh, said that uh, you know, the ideal is to um, uh, 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 in, uh, sort of uh, um, um, uh, inject the feudal spirit into uh, the centralized government. But by feudal spirit, it really, it really means this sort of a, a decentralized you know, feudal, uh, you know, autonomous states. So I think that's sort of the confusion uh, effort to, to address this issue. Um, and actually in my uh, uh, proposal on the sort of confusion global order, I try to argue why states still uh, are important because I think states still, uh, we, need to, uh, need, we need to have competing states uh, to uh, drive us forward. So we don't want the compete, uh, competition to become wars. But at, at the same time, we don't want we want some competition to prevent human beings uh, becoming uh, what Nietzsche called the last man, right? The people who have no uh, desire to to compete. So n n that's you know my idea um, on, on that issue. But then about the sort of fragmentation of expertise. So in in my proposal, I did say that we could have different tracks for the upper house, right? You could take the economics tri track or, you know, uh, 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 natural science tra track, but probably a better solution, if probably, you know, now that I'm thinking about your question is, again, going back to the, 
the old Confucian uh, kind of uh, you know, civil service exam. So they're testing people on, uh, you know, uh, a few Confucian classics, the Analects and Mencius. It's sort of like the, the tests are based on Platonic dialogues in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. So, you know, the, master, the mastery of those texts, of course, doesn't tell you how to solve uh, flooding, uh, you know, uh, in, in the lowland uh, area. Um, but it seems that, you know, those, the people who passed those exams in China in the past, uh, first of all, I think they prove themselves that they're capable of mastering whatever you give them, you know, uh, and so they have this kind of uh, you know, capacity of learning new things. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's what the, the exams are good for, uh, you know, uh, and uh, moreover, uh, the, the classics tell them, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, you should uh, care about the people and things like that. So they, they're, they, they, they become almost like, you know, the sort of the British gentlemen, uh, you know, uh, rulers that are sent out to rule a colony, you know. Uh, I'm not endorsing colonialism, but I'm just saying that, you know, although they are gentlemen, they, they, they read a, a few classics, but, you know, they, 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 they can become, you know, they can adapt themselves quickly and become for benign rulers. Uh, so maybe, you know, uh, I mean, it sounds self-serving. So we should have, you know, uh, for the top, you know, members of the upper house, we should have those who go through liberal arts, you know, philosophical education. Uh, so that they, they are, they can be, uh, you know. I agree with uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, but that, that, that just sounds too self-serving to me. Uh, but but that, that's, that's the answer I can come up with right now. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah, you. Thank so uh, we have Mario and uh, Karsten will be next. Uh, thank you, Dal, for the opportunity to ask. And thank you for the very engaging lecture. Um, lots of interesting ideas. I'm not sure about, I, I would agree about this comparison between um, Joe dynasty developments and, and the emergence of modern, uh, uh, modern Europe. But I think what, what, if I understand correctly, what you're trying to do is to look back to Chinese intellectual uh, traditions for answers to contemporary issues. And of course, also understanding the history and so on, but also repositories of models, ideas we can use to develop a better society. And I think that's, that's very uh, rightly so. I mean, uh, Chinese people have long history, illustrious culture and so on. But the, the problem is, I mean, your, your criticism of uh, democracy of one person, one, one vote, obviously there are lots of problems and in ideal form never exists because ultimately it's uh, people who are not ideal, who are basically morons who vote for, I don't know, the kind of leaders we have now. So that, that's obviously a problem when you have uninformed public who, who selects leaders and then they have to cater to the whims, to the desires, to the biases of, of the majority and so on. So that's, that's all true, but then, uh, when we look at the Confucian mo model, either, yeah, maybe if you ask me, like, would I be ruled by some sage, uh, some kind of morally upright person in a tune with the Dao and reality rather than Donald Trump? Sure, I would, but I'm not sure how many individuals like that have existed in, in history. And also, who decides? I mean, before it was like heaven speak, but that's a little bit vague for God speak in a European context. The problem with God is he never speaks. It's always people, individuals claim to speak on behalf of God, and they have their own interests, they have all their own agenda and so on. And looking for empirical evidence, I mean, there is the ideal model, but also we have long history of Chinese government and Manchus was quite popular, influential leader for the last, I don't know how you count, certainly from the Tang dynasty, but even before. So many Chinese elites have studied, they have been exams and so on. And I'm sorry to say, but the empirical evidence does not quite bear that this is a very a good model because whatever system you have, when you have system of meritocracy, you have individuals who have vested interest to perpetuate their own power and their own agendas. And how do you modulate it? How do you have checks and balances on those kind of systems? You set up this kind of mechanism for the people, we are to do it for the people Hitler was claiming to, you know, to do for the German people, you know, there was this flourishing in the 30s and Mao was claiming to do the same thing in the 60s. So this kind of, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't try to be cynical. I think it's good idea. I'm not kind of 
try to advocate for democracy, well, I, I think it's a better model, but obviously there are lots of problems. It's just, I don't see it workable, and maybe part of the problem, going back to one of the questions, was what if uh, mentions was, uh, was wrong? What if we human beings are not as noble as uh, Menchus, uh, humanistic tradition in Europe tried to tell us? What if we are not potentially Buddhas or enlightened beings or rational beings and so on. What if you are selfish and if whatever system you have, you will have imperfect, you, you have an educational system, people will, will manipulate it. I mean, people will, whether it's a college admission system or, or even if they pass the exams, I mean, we, we have in our students, so they look for credentials, it doesn't mean they get education or learn something. And then education, passing an exam, being a moral person and working for the welfare of others and being selfless. And so that's something, something very different. It comes, have to come from somewhere else. There is no system that can mold people into that. And we have other exams out of China. We have all kinds of theocratic uh, regimes to claim to be based on morality and concern for... And the history, empirically speaking, is not very good. So while I salute, I think it's a good idea, something to look for. I have very much doubt about it. It goes back to the basic makeup of human beings who might not be as evolved, as perfect, as noble, as prone to rationality, to compassion, to kindness, to, to, to goodness, as some, us, I mean, biased human beings claim for us to be. Anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I think, first of all, uh, I, I want to clarify. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a political theorist. So I, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about you know, uh, training Chinese regimes in any way uh, uh, realize what I'm proposing here. So what I'm proposing is based on some ideas by, by, by Mencius and try to imagine kind of political institution. Uh, so so um, actually uh, in my book I mentioned that the, co the, the, real world, the real world regime that comes closest to my proposal is not in China, rather is the, is the American regime at its founding. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the Federalists, many of their arguments are quite similar to the arguments I'm making. And so they designed the American regime to, in order to check and balance the voice of the people. The Senate was not directly uh, elected, president was elected, elected by electors. You know, those were designs to prevent people from having too much say in politics. But unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, there were problems, deep problems in the American regime at its founding, you know, slavery, uh, gender inequality. So uh, my understanding is that when they try to get rid of these problems, they get rid of the, the checks and balances of the people uh, as well. Uh, and uh, so, so I'm talking about the ideal regime. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing, you know, um, the kind of, conf although I said I, I'm using Mencius ideas, Mencius was not very big on institutions. Uh, and so in my book, you know, in the introductory chapter, I said that, you know, so my a Confucian model is uh, sort of a legalized Confucian model. By legalized, I mean uh, the uh, the Chinese uh, school of thought, legalism. Uh, you know, legalism is very like Han Fei's. You know, uh, Han Fei criticized uh, Confucian for offering these kind of vague, you know, arbitrary ideas of virtue. But you know, but in, in, in real world politics, you need to have procedures, verifiable procedures. Um, I think that's that's a very strong and valid. Criticisms. So, so in that sense, my version is kind of a legalized version, namely institutionalized version of uh, Mencius' ideas. So it's not; it doesn't depend on uh, in, you know uh, the good the goodness of one individual. Rather, I hope a mechanism, an institution, can select, identify those who are uh, good, right? And uh, um, and so so I'm all for the checks and balances, you know, and that's why I think the liberal part of liberal democracy is very important. I argue in other places why Confucianism can be made compatible. For one thing, actually, I, uh, I use the, the, the trick, uh, so-called fallback mechanisms. So for Confucian, ideally, we want uh, rulers to be virtuous, but just in case they're not, there are rule of law and you know, constitution, uh, constitutionalism, uh, you know, um, that prevents them from making, you know, terrible, uh, 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 terrible mistakes. And then, uh, then, of course, then I have to believe that this, uh, these institutions can somehow identify those who are good 
uh, leaders. Um, and, you know, m m maybe, uh, you know, they are, uh, I mean, I think precisely because I don't think there are so many good people out there. Uh, you know, I, I think that's why I think, you know, we need this kind of uh, meritocracy, you know, the few, pe few people being given more political decision power. Uh, but then I have to believe that at least there are some people who are good enough. Uh, and, uh, but maybe they're not really profoundly good. But as I said, you know, one mechanism is for someone to be a governor of state for two terms. So at least 80 years, he, has, he or she has to pretend to care about the people. Yeah, Mencius has this almost cynical uh, observation. He said that you know, all the five hegemons, they pretend to be human rulers. But then he says, if you pretend long enough, it will grow on you, right? You, you will become the thing you pretend to be. So I think you know, we, we can never be sure uh, you know whether this is good person uh, in heart, but if we could have institutions that somehow guarantee that at least this is a very good poser, you know, who can continue to pose for the rest of his life, that that would be good enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Karsten and uh, Joe. Well, that will be that will be it. Yeah. Thank, thank you for your talk. It's very stimulating and it raises thank you. lots of questions. I, I have one specific question and feeding off that are one or two others. The, the main specific question is how would the methods of selection ensure not just that people had knowledge and ability to critically think about things, but would be able to manifest Confucian virtues, the, the the seeds growing to full development. Um, you know, I think about uh, people like Mussolini, who had a PhD in uh, philosophy. Uh, those British gentlemen you talked about are responsible for doing horrible things in China and in India, other places. Uh, who was very smart, and he, he had no sense of compassion and. Uh, so, I could the medical passing tests uh, that would show that they have that very smart and knowledgeable about things and be totally unvirtuous in almost every sense of the word, including and especially in terms of the Confucian virtues. Um, so, that leads me to just one other aspect of the question. And it's a problem here, not just with Confucian theory, it's also a problem with liberal democratic theory. Uh, it starts off as ideal theory. And there's, I, I think there's a serious argument to be made for non-ideal theory, that you start with the actual problems and then you see what kinds of things might respond to the problems, that certain elements of Confucianism might respond to the problems as other things. But if we do it on just the theoretical level, I'm still left feeling, okay, how in the real world do we ensure that people of virtue get selected? Not just people who are smart and, you know, they know where Iraq is. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> right, so again, you know, uh, I have different mechanisms, right? One is, you know, a kind of um, a practical service. If you, if you prove yourself through your service, you know, uh, I mentioned, you know, two-term governors, or in the American case, you know, a lot of, you know, people who serve in the military out of patriotic ideas. So they are patriotic, right? And uh, they serve in the military, they become officers. It means that they can do the work. And they, uh, they also later join, uh, sort of, na say, in the Naval Academy, right? So I think, you know, military people, uh, tend to be, you know, honest, you know, through this kind of process. But of course, then you have Mac, Mac Pompeo, you know, who was number one in his class. Uh, but so, but at least I, I think I, I can only say, statistically speaking, right, you know, through these mechanisms, we might be able to identify more, you know, honest, hardworking, competent people. And also in terms of exams, of course, exams don't test everything. Uh, it's probably don't test virtually. Actually, that's why a lot of Confucians were against the Kaji exams, uh, because they thought that you know civil service exams didn't test the kind of virtue they would like to uh, to test. But my question for those confusion is that if now those exams, what else can you use? Uh, I think that actually that's Han Fei's you know the legalist criticism of 
Confucian, you know, it sounds wonderful to uh, have a moral person, but how do you know who uh, is a moral person? So you have to have some kind of proxies uh, uh, to, 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 to do that. And, but as long as I think you, 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 uh, you acknowledge that uh, the, com the, the average voters are fundamentally inadequate, uh, if that's a theoretical issue, uh, uh, even in the ideal uh, uh, case, then we should have something to, 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 to balance it uh, by using proxies to identify, um, you know, uh, so-called virtues and, 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 and competent, uh, competent people. Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's my, my answer to, to your question. Yeah. I, I'm still left with the question, how do we, how do we actually have a selection process other than, okay, maybe some people have proved things, but in terms of exams or in terms of lower house choosing, how do we know that there are people of virtues? We have lots of historical evidence that people who may have skills in various ways, including having done certain things, are not terribly virtuous. And, and, your, and your program depends on having some reasonable selection process to, for people who actually have the Confucian virtues. Right, so, you know, um, so in, 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 you know, in the three, as I said, exams don't test all the virtues, but test some virtues, uh, you know, like- Give me, an, you know, give me um, an example. The classics, you mean? Uh, yeah, no, uh, any kind of exams uh, test- How like, do we you test know, for compassion? No, compassion is very difficult to test. Uh, so that's why I said some virtues that are important for the leader, like, you know, perseverance, right? Mm -hmm. Delayed gratification. And maybe hopefully by reading the good stories from the past, you know, those exam takers can take some of those in, but not, I, think, I don't think exams are very good at those things. That's why I think, you know, maybe some kind of practical training, right? Just test them in reality, send them out to, to office and see how they do. Uh, and uh, uh, then also the level model, you know, uh, there are already legislators on a lower level and then they vote for uh, a legislator on a higher level. But I think the key, you know, the positive thing is about funding virtuous people. And also there's the other side. Um, I think, you know, my, my worry about democracy that voters are fundamentally ignorant and almost, uh, sometimes immoral. And if then politicians are held always are held accountable to them. They can never make decisions that are good for the, even for the people, uh, for their long-term interests. So somehow the, you know, some politicians have to be freed from the, the, the bind of the people. And uh, uh, so, so if you can somehow identify competent and somewhat virtuous people, and then just more importantly, separate them from the voting public, you know, they're not subjected to, to voting anymore. Then maybe they can make some decisions. Of course, they could make terrible decisions. Um, but, you know, uh, it seems that, uh, especially now we have all these issues, you know, climate change and things like that. Uh, you know, I, I think you know, democracy is fundamentally inadequate to deal with that issue. So in that sense, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to take a risk of giving more power to the so-called elite. Again, as I said, you know, it doesn't have to be so drastic. I, I, I'm trying to offer a kind of comprehensive pro, uh, program, but you know, in the American setting, I said, uh, as I mentioned, maybe just one requirement. You know, every presidential candidate has to be a governor uh, for one term, right? Of course, it's not perfect. You know, it does. It, uh, you know, it excludes also uh, Obama. But as I said, Obama could probably would become a governor if there is such a requirement. But at the same time, it does uh, uh, exclude uh, Trump. Trump, there's no way Trump can become a governor of any state, you know, and, but it doesn't exclude Sarah Palin, you know, who is not a, who is not a good politician. Uh, yeah, so, so it cannot be perfect, but still, you know, we could have some probably more manageable uh, um, mechanisms, you know, to at least to weed out some of those, uh, you know, demagogues from this. But Mussolini, I, I, I don't know, you know, he's, he's a tough case to, 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 to exclude. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, uh, Joe Haraf, want to raise your question? So that will be our last question. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Tao and um, uh, Professor Bai for the um, uh, exciting and enlightening talk. Um, you know, it, it's good to hear you in, in live voice uh, to kind of, yeah. and, and what you're, what the tensions that you're thinking through as, as a political theorist, uh, it, it's energizing to kind of get back to your work and, and also struggle with these tensions as well. But I, yeah, I, I guess I have two questions uh, that I hope you could um, you kind of uh, elucidate or, or clarify for me. Like one is like, as a political theorist, I, I like that distinction that you're, you're using the past to kind of um, reimagine what's, what's possible uh, uh, for, for the for the future, um, and even if it's like the long durée, right? Like that, that you're, you know, you're you're not naively hoping for any of this to kind of materialize soon, but but yet, um, you're 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 kind of bravely uh, rethinking some of the basic categories um, within liberalism. And I was surprised when I when I read this in your work too. Like uh, I would have, uh, I guess, classified you as as an illiberal kind of uh, uh, you know proponent of, of of Confucian democracy, right? But but I think it's uh, I guess my question is, do you find attention in in um, or, or a kind of creative uh, uh, resolution of, of getting to a point where liberalism no longer means simply, uh, as you said, uh, rule of law and kind of respect for individual human rights, but, but by using Confucian means to kind of defend this, uh, you know, this enlightenment baby, you, you've thrown off a lot of bathwater, right? Uh, and and you're, you're, you're presuming this, but, but doesn't it also kind of uh, require us to kind of also rethink even what kind of rights uh, discourse could be doing in a kind of global, you know, geopolitical framework. So that, that's my first question. Um, and then the second one, I, I think it's related to Karsten's, right? Like uh, how, like, not only like, how are we pragmatically going to test, um, but like, uh, oh, and I also wanted to mention, you know, like, like Churchill's kind of quip about democracy, uh, mm -hmm. I think is, uh, you know, maybe better put by, by Dewey, who says like the solution for the ills of democracy uh, is, is more democracy, right? And then this gets us to the idea of, of kind of communicative praxis, right? Uh, and so if, if Lee as kind of a ritual community of interpretation um, is, 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 is seeking kind of uh, productive um, and kind of efficient and exemplary communicators, like, like, like you mentioned Mencius uh, in, in, in 3A4, where like at the same time, he's, 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 he's saying by nature, things are unequal, but then yeah, anyone could become a Yao and Shun if they fake it long enough, right? Um, and, and it's because of this idea that duh, like virtue or virtuosity is kind of relationally constituted, right? Like it's, it's how one has a kind of moral charisma to make a, a kind of moral suasion uh, in, in, in public space. And so then like if we, even before the Kudru Jirdu, like before the, 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 the testing system, uh, you know, Confucians like Mencius are always quoting from the classics, right? Uh, from the odes, from the documents. And, and so they become effective communicators. Um, even as as sure as kind of scholar officials, which which they're like coming from the 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 kind of um, the commoners, right? Um, so like I, I guess can can you can you I guess come up with some some creative uh, means or strategies for like uh, I guess and also yeah the basic question can you decouple that idea of like yeah not just testing it like in a foreign service sense like your your knowledge of geography but like how about Edward Said and and, and kind of imagine geographies right uh, can you um, can you kind of test and, and also kind of create a space in which we share a vocabulary because we're, we're able to kind of cite productively from the odes. Like we end, we end our argument with a song uh, and, 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 you, and you can kind of decide whether or not that's a, that's a good kind of way of using the odes, right? Um, and, and, and yeah, like using history, uh, the documents or whatever to like to, to creatively create a space in which we, we, we create a community that then allows for more kind of democratic praxis and transformative praxis. And so yeah, I'll, I'll Keep it short there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, right. So uh, about Dewey's idea, I think you know it's it's quite common among uh, Western political theorists that they think that the problem they they acknowledge there are a lot of problems with democracy, but uh, they think that the 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 solution uh, just as Dewey says, less in more democracy. Uh, the problem uh, comes from uh, not enough in, uh, equality. We need more equality. Um, but I think that's my, my, my sort of judgment call. I, I think that um, uh, now we see more and more uh, the conflict between uh, the liberal part of liberal democracy and the uh, democratic or egalitarian part of uh, democracy. Uh, and uh, um, and so, uh, so I guess you know that that's my fundamental difference. And uh, you know, I don't. I, I think the problem of democracy is precisely too much democracy, too much equality. And uh, so I want to 
uh, 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 kind of uh, correct this excessive inequality in order to save liberalism. So in, in that sense, I, I, I consider myself a, a, a liberal, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and precisely because I'm liberal, I, I, I think democracy should be uh, uh, limited, uh, you know, corrected with, demo uh, with meritocracy. And actually this and the similar thing with the global order. And uh, I think, you know, uh, the UN model where every state is considered equal. And I think it has a similar problem with, you know, uh, within a, a, a state, every voter is considered equal. So in, in, the, uh, in the international, uh, on a global scale, I, I also propose a sort of hierarchical model. You know, those who perform their human duties better should form an alliance to become the de facto world police, right? Now, world police doesn't sound uh, like a good term, but I think, you know, uh, it, we need proper world police. I mean, in the pandemic, we need, uh, uh, you know, a certain state to lead, uh, uh, you know, the rest of the world. But uh, the two countries that are most capable of doing that clearly don't do any of the jobs, right? Uh, and uh, I think you uh, probably is doing better, um, but you know, uh, you is just one uh, entity. Um, yeah, so, um, and, and about the, the use of O's and things like that, I'm not sure. So I, I think for Manishas, you know, uh, that was their uh, cultural background they use the o's you know in plato's uh, in plato in, in platonic dialogue they use homer uh you know uh, and uh, um so so in so in, in sort of this kind of uh, ideal situation i think all these great books from the past um by white men yellow men chinese you know uh, uh, uh you know uh, arabs all these should be uh, part of this, you know, uh, uh, collective uh, human heritage, right? So this should be the basis of education and uh, uh, examination. Uh, so I think, you so know, the liberal arts uh, PhD is, is still uh, the liberal arts yeah, PhD is, is, is you're not you're right, not being right. promoting like yeah. that. That's really at, at the heart of this, like a global uh, literacy in right. human. Right. You know, right. Human yeah, but 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 uh, just you know. Uh, to say something political, political incorrect, um, you know, uh, but, you know, uh, because uh, you know, people like Brian Van Norden argues that we should have, you know, a philosophy department should teach all kinds of philosophy. But I think that, you know, uh, uh, at least, you know, I think for something to be considered philosophy, you need to have written records so that we can, you know, and I think philosophy is fundamentally reflective. You need to have, uh, some acc accumulation of knowledge, and this can, e you know, uh, easily be done if we have a written history. So in that sense, you know, I don't think uh, a, a, a people that doesn't have a written uh, a language, a written history, uh, could produce uh, philosophy in a proper sense. They might have interesting ideas uh, from uh, for someone with a written history, but I think they they don't have a kind of cumulative. Uh, collection of of ideas. I think that's you probably so, didn't say that in so, Hawaii. Right? So, so global, but not not that global. I guess that that's what I'm trying to say. Um, okay, uh, so. I, I was uh, I, I, I was just gonna uh, conclude on that uh, global uh, sort of liberal arts <laughs> curriculum education. Um, anyways, um, Hagab uh, Sarkisian has this comment. He said nearly all academics have passed big exams to get their PhDs, but few are good administrators. So that certainly presents uh, a kind of a challenge for the test or exam-based kind of a selection. And so the test has to be really, really uh, yeah, uh, well-designed in some ways. Yeah, but there are other tracks. You know, John McCain could become a the, senator the, through the, his military the, service. They could be, yeah. Now he did poorly in college, but still there is a track for him as well. Right, right. So anyways, um, all right. So there, there actually, I myself have tons and tons of, of questions, but I, I'd rather not raise here so we can talk uh, later. But let's wrap up for tonight's conversation. So thank you, Tom Dong, very much for giving mm -hmm. us a lot to digest. And thank you all for being part of the conversation. 
So um, I, I'm going to stop the recording and people, if you want to uh, hang out a little more with you and, and chat more, uh, you feel welcome to do it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.